we are very honored and delighted to welcome the first speaker of the day to the stage. A very warm and loud applause to Mr. Anan. Good morning, my dear friends, excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Let me thank you for that very warm welcome. I would also want to thank Minister Schulz van Hagen for inviting me to join you today. Nan and I are particularly happy to be here. We didn't know much about the absolute uh, dike. But uh, when we read about it, it sounded very exciting, and thanks for bringing us here. I am particularly pleased also to see so many young people, young entrepreneurs, innovators among the audience today. I can't think of a more symbolic and inspirational location to promote innovative solutions around water, food, and energy than the iconic Afslaut Dyke. I hope I pronounced that properly. <laughs> this dam is a masterpiece of Dutch engineering and a symbol for the country's centuries-long fight against flooding from the sea. Early on, your engineers understood that one would have to work with nature rather than against it by simply holding back the ocean. This innovative dam guarantees the safety of land and people while allowing the rise and fall of the tides, which is crucial for the ecosystems to function properly. Its construction also led to the creation of a major freshwater lake that guarantees drinking water supplies and a huge area of very fertile land for agriculture from the former seabed. Above all, the dike, together with the, world, with the UNESCO World Heritage Site, Wadden Sea, to its north, has become a major tourist magnet, contributing to the socio-economic development of regions nearby. Ladies and gentlemen, the Afslaut Dike is bringing substantial benefits to all three sectors that we are going to be discussing today, water, food, and energy. Stresses on these precious resources are sharply increasing due to population growth, rapid urbanization, and changing diets driven by economic growth. It is estimated that by 2030, the global population will need at least 40% more water, 35% more food, and 50% more energy. But our planetary boundaries are already reaching their limits. For we are exploiting finite resources at an alarming rate and causing huge damage to our environment. We cannot continue exploiting the resources of the world as if there were no tomorrow, and it, not to think of future generations. Our predominant model of development is en encouraging wasteful production and consumption patterns. It is a moral outrage that 30% of food produced for human consumption is spoiled or squandered every year. Even just one quarter of that amount of food, if saved, could be enough to feed 870 million hungry people around the world. Hundreds of our fellow human beings lack access to both water and energy, which are the cornerstones for economic progress and poverty alleviation. The growing impact of climate change is exacerbating these challenges and pushing and risk pushing millions 
more into abject poverty and hunger. And as always, it is the world's poorest, the most vulnerable, who are paying the price. Ladies and gentlemen, the challenges we are facing are huge. But fortunately, we are not starting from scratch. With sustainable development goals and the Paris Agreement on Climate Change, world leaders have adopted a compelling vision with ambitious goals. The role of governments is vital in implementing those goals. But it is not governments alone. It is not the responsibility of governments alone. It requires cooperation and partnership between every sector of society. No one has all the answers, but let me set out a few priorities as I see them. First, the complexities of today's challenges call for a holistic systems approach rather than a siloed approaches. Too often, policy, <coughs> policies to manage water, food, energy, resources are developed and implemented in, uh, in isolation when we know that they are interlinked. Decision makers have to foster policy coherence and enhance coordination and collaboration amongst diverse actors to ensure that co-benefits and trade-offs are considered and that appropriate safeguards can be put in place. Second, we must seize this moment. Seize this moment to change the way we produce and consume energy. As a global community, we have the technology finance and ingenuity to, back, to embark on a low carbon transition. Shifting towards renewable energy sources is not only helping to avoid, avert climate catastrophe, but also creating new opportunities for investment, growth, and employment. It is also the most promising way to provide access to modern energy services to the over 1.2 billion people worldwide who lack access to electricity, something we all take for granted. They don't have it. Another advantage is that clean energy contributes to preserving our water ecosystems. Unlike fossil fuels, most renewables such as solar, wind, and geothermal energy consume very little or no water. Both governments and businesses have to accelerate the transition to low-carbon energy systems by investing in renewables, prioritizing energy-efficient practices, and developing and deploying clean technologies and related infrastructure. The Afslaut Dyke, for example, is a perfect location for exploiting the benefits of such synergies. And I'm glad that the dam is already serving as a trial site for tidal energy and osmosis energy. Third, we need to explore how water, food, and energy nexus can support agricultural development and food and nutrition security. Agriculture accounts for 70% of the global freshwater withdrawals and more than one quarter of the energy used globally is expended on food production and supply systems. Especially in water-scarce regions, we need robust strategies to end wasteful water use and protect water availability to maintain agricultural production and avoid food price volatility. As the global demand for food keeps growing, we need smarter policies and greater investment in sustainable agriculture to increase productivity, particularly in the global south, and promote innovation 
across the entire value chain to promote, to contribute to more efficient resource use. Above all, we need new emphasis on climate smart agriculture and food systems. This is a promising way to enable farmers to adapt to changing weather conditions, growing seasons that threaten food production. I was impressed when I heard that Dutch researchers recently have found a way of cultivating specific crop varieties to thrive in salinized water and soil, salinized soil. Climate smart, solutions, climate smart solutions, such as the use of salt, drought, and heat-tolerant crops, and efficient irrigation systems are critical for food and nutrition security. Nowhere is this more important than on my own continent, Africa, where climate change is already turning vast areas of productive land into dust bowls, creating widespread hunger, mass displacement, conflict among local communities and states. According to the World Bank, climate impacts could push an additional 100 million people into poverty by 2030 if we fail to take serious action now. Governments have to act and act quickly and implement the Paris Agreement, which is a huge opportunity for the world to create a sustainable future. It is also important that richer countries provide financial resources and technologies to help the poorer countries cut emissions and adapt to the impact of climate change. Specifically, developed countries must deliver on their commitment to mobilize $100 billion annually for the Green Fund, which pays particular attention to the needs of highly vulnerable societies, in particular least developed countries, such as small island states and some of the African states. Major emitting countries should also cut carbon. They should put in place credible carbon pricing taxation and systems instead of spending billions on fossil fuel subsidies. This will lower carbon emissions effectively and unlock huge economic opportunities. But allow me to stress that by its very nature, Climate change is a cause that should unite us all. Governments, businesses, investors, civil society, individuals, and mobilize entire society to fight it. When we see what is happening recently, Harvey in the US, Irma in the Caribbean, causing lots of problems and destruction, this is something that we all need to work together to ensure that it's not as frequent as it threatens to be and hopefully we can all work together to contain this. Dear friends, we clearly have an ambitious agenda ahead of us, but I'm confident that we can turn aspiration into action and build a more prosperous and sustainable world. Your leadership, actions, and ideas must play an important role in this effort. And I'm really happy that there are so many young entrepreneurs and innovators here. This is a special challenge to you. And I often say that one is never too young to lead, nor too old to learn. So let's work together to ensure that we make a difference. I wish you a productive conference and look forward to learning about your innovations and solutions during today's special Making Waves event. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your inspiring and heartfelt words.
May I invite you to join me to, to take a seat? There's only one seat. No, there, there will be two. I'm the, I'm the youngest, so I have to stand. <laughs> no, we're going to take a seat. Thank you. So if I may ask, mm -hmm. what is your personal connection with this location, with the Afsluitdijk in the Netherlands? I've been very, very keen on the environment. And apart from the work we do at the foundation, I also serve as climate champion for the World Bank. And I see climate change as one of the, as the greatest challenge facing us uh, today. It is a threat to our health, source of food, source of fresh water, and it can really uh, make nonsense of all our efforts to push GDP and others if we don't uh, stop it. And this is a wonderful example yeah. of what can be done with creativity, innovation, and imagination. And I think uh, Netherlands, as a leader in this field, has a lot to share with the rest of the world. You have been working for more than 50 years on topics like climate change, peace, with everything that is going on right now in the world in terms of safety, national disasters, the political situation. How do you stay optimistic? That's a very good question. Uh, first of all, I started by challenging the young people. I have lots of hope in the next generation. I think the younger generation who are men and women of their times and understand the world we are living in and are so wired and are technologically alert are going to work with us to find the solutions that we need. Yes, there are lots of political conflicts from the uh, Middle East to Myanmar, which I've been working on, uh, to conflicts in Africa. But here, I often challenge the leaders to develop the political will to help resolve these conflicts. But we should also not lead it, leave it to the leaders alone. We all have roles. Individuals have responsibility. In, take the environment, for example. Individuals have power. We can exercise our power by the choices we make, what we decide to buy, which companies we decide to support. Do we support green, uh, inclined companies, or just go buying from companies that pollute? People can pr push the politicians to focus on issues of concern to them by raising issues of concern to us higher up the political agenda. Yep. We all have a responsibility. Yep. And I've often noticed that when leaders fail to lead, the people can lead and make them follow. Yep. I, think a I think that's worth an applause. <laughs> But, but I think at times it's so difficult with a lot of things happening in the world that sometimes you feel really small. So what kind of advice would you like to give us as an audience to take that leadership? Yeah. How, where yeah. do you start? No, first of all, when I talk of leadership and I tell you to take action, I'm not asking the younger people in this room to go and tackle Syria, to resolve Syria. I'm not asking them to go and deal with North Korea. In our everyday lives and in our own communities, we see challenges that we can tackle. It may be in the schoolyard when you see somebody being bullied and say, stop, we cannot take this anymore. You may decide that... Um, Were you like that at a young age? Were you the child who was like, stop well, the bullying? And <laughs> I, I, I organized a hunger strike once when I was 15 at the boarding school. <laughs> activistic, you're activistic. So at least uh, I I did show some action, yeah. And and this is how it starts. It starts with the community. So when young people ask, "How do I become a good global citizen?" It starts in the schoolyard, in the community, in the family. You take action. You organize yourself with other people to clear what you think is wrong. And if each of us, if we all do our little bit. Collectively, we make a giant contribution. Yeah. So don't focus on the big issues. There are lots of issues around you that one can resolve. And some of the innovations you are working on is already taking leadership.
Yeah. I would like now <coughs> to give the audience also the opportunity to ask a question. So I'm going to look around. Who has a question for Mr. Question. Anan? Here at the front. There will be a microphone. Yeah, uh, my name is Art Spijkers. I worked like uh, Mr. Kofi Annan in the United Nations. I was heading the Food and Agriculture Organization in Congo in Bangladesh. And Mr. Kofi Annan, I'm really very proud that what you speak us tomorrow, that you give us a way, I think, how investments in technology are so important to make progress in humanity. We have one question about Africa. We have many young Africans who are moving to Europe as they see no way out at the moment. Mm. We worked together on the peace in Congo 10 years ago with Mr. Bullswing and others. I believe in this audience and this uh, group of universities and ministries that opportunity that we can make these ideas how Africa can be developed. Because I believe the, the root cause, and you will agree with me, is that economic progress is needed in the continent. Yeah. There is plenty of water, there is plenty of land. What we need is management, investment, and technology. And please give us a few of your thoughts yeah. on this. Okay. Thank you very much for your question. No, that's, that's a very good question, and it's good to see you again. Um, about 15 years ago, I was invited to give a speech at the Council of uh, Europe. I accepted. I was then Secretary General. Uh, actually, it was more than... Yeah, they, they didn't know what I was going to talk about. I didn't tell them. They offered me the Sakharov Prize, and I was to receive the prize and make some comments. My topic was immigration, basically indicating that immigration, as we saw it then and as we see it now, uh, cannot be stopped, but it has to be managed, managed in a manner that is in the interest of the country of origin, country of transit, and country of final destination and above all in the interest of the migrant. And one of the first questions I got was from a French politician, a conservative college politician, uh, uh, Charles uh, Pasqua. Charles Pasqua asked, Monsieur le Secretaire General, don't you think the best thing to do is to develop Africa so that people don't have incentive to move out? And I said, I, I agree. We need to develop Africa. We need to work in partnership to develop it. And in developing Africa, technology and uh, innovation can play a very important role. With technology and innovation, whether in energy or other areas, Africa can frog leap some of the mistakes and some of the dirty processes the developed world went through to get to where it is today. Uh, in, in fact, today in Africa, I'm encouraging very much the use of clean energy, solar, wind, and all that. And also the way the African cities and villages are laid out, you are much better off using standalone solar systems and linking up to the grid rather than trying to uh, give access to the whole nation through the national grid. So technology is important. So as you invent and create, don't think uh, Africa and the third world countries are so far behind. Uh, in fact, th they become the true laboratory to test some of these things and to move forward some of the new advances that we, we have. And if we can help Africa develop through technology, through investments, through partnerships, and people can make a decent living at home, they will have less inducement to move out and look for greener pastures. So I agree with the import of your question. Maybe another question from the audience. Yes, on the left side. Uh, can you please stand up or, or, you, or maybe I don't, yes. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, my name is Felix Wollenberg, and as a youthful individual, I do feel the warmth of freedom, but I can't see the light because by the grace of time's I can't support, hear him. I we, can, we cannot hear you very well. Maybe you can speak a little. Do I need to speak harder? Sorry, I yeah, echo, but still. A little slower and a more clearer. And a bit away from the mic. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> mm -hmm. My name is Felix Wollenberg, and as a youthful individual, I do see the light. I do feel the warmth of freedom, but I can't see the light because by the grace of times past, 
I've never had to witness the darkness myself. Right now, we are looking towards solutions, towards answers, and throughout the chaos, we have to use for individuals primarily trying to engage themselves in politics. How do you see yourself and society as a whole dealing with the problem or actually the grace of times past that we have so much peace these days and that all the small issues these days are being felt as used blows towards and rebukes towards a society while so much things are already going great? How do you see that as society and as youthful individuals, I'm grateful for peace, but by the same issue, we are having an issue with keeping it? Do you get the question? I'm not sure that I really get your question. I think that you're making a statement that things are already going great, that we maybe need to praise also that a lot of things are already good and already happening. I don't know if that's a summary of what you wanted to... The, the sound hear. was very difficult for me it to hear. It was very difficult. The, why don't you maybe stand on the side and please give the mic to him rather than holding it? G give him the mic and let him be the star. Let's try again. Maybe very short, in one sentence, what is yeah. your main your question, question to Mr. Anand? As a youthful individual, I do feel the warmth of freedom, but I can't see the light, but because grace is of the time past, I haven't witnessed the darkness myself. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I, want, I want to stop this uh, question. <laughs> I don't think we have a lot of time to make very long speeches. Uh, what I wanted to ask you is that one of the very important sustainable development goals is number 17, which is about partnerships. Do you see successful collaborations around the world um, that are an example of these crossover partnerships? No, I, I think partnerships are beginning to work. We are doing better at partnerships today than we were 20 years ago. And when I refer to partnerships, I mean partnerships between private and the public uh, sector, partnership between civil society groups, universities, partnerships between communities uh, at sub-national level sharing uh, experience. And so a, a lot is happening. And in fact, even in agriculture, we are working a lot with encouraging some of the bigger farms to work with small-scale farmers. For example, in Africa, 70% of the food is produced by smallholder farmers who sometimes don't have access to the right seeds, the right fertilizer, the right inputs, and access to market. But in some situations, you have a, a fairly large commercial farm which works with these small farmers, gives them inputs, assures them steady market, buys at fair prices, and that partnership is not big versus small, but big and small working together to feed the people and particularly those who move to rural areas. We've seen situations where the private sector or foundations like the Gates Foundation, one of the best examples I saw was when we set up the Global Fund. We decided the Global Fund should bring everyone together and so the board of the fund had government representatives, business representatives, and civil society representatives. And the chairmanship rotates. Since its inception, we've had somebody from civil society, from business, and government chairing this. And billions have been raised and spent on protecting those living with HIV. So I'm, I'm very much a believer in partnerships and we should all... Uh, I think we're, today we're going to try to make a lot of those crossover partnerships here at the event. Um, a final question. It's for the young entrepreneurs who will be taking the stage mm. today. Do you have a final advice or that you want to give to those, especially those young entrepreneurs? First of all, it's wonderful that uh, you have the courage, the creativity and the imagination to want to start something new, to start something on your own. There will be failures and disappointments along the way, but don't give up. Keep going, and your inventions should be related also to needs of society. Uh, what is it that your invention or innovation can help deal with? Which issues are we trying to 
resolved. We have lots of problems and issues around us. And so my advice is, and also corporate. I know inventors sometimes tend to be very protective of knowledge and information. But sometimes when you cooperate and you reach out and discuss with each other, you both move further together and, and you move faster. Uh, and so, yes, you may want to have your uh, copyright, you may want to have your invention protected, but some, <clears throat> sometimes working with others and coming up with something, even if you have to share the profits, is a much better and a faster way of going. But above all, don't be disappointed if you fail. I work for an organization, uh, the United Nations. People thought we only talked. You and us talk, talk, talk. And I used to remind them. And when a scientist is inventing something and he tries an experiment, he may only succeed once out of 100 attempts. Is the 99 times he failed waste of time? No, it is creative redundancy. Our talking is our creative redundancy. <laughs> and sometimes we come up with a big convention, with a big uh, idea, you know, like sustainable uh, development goals. Yes. So don't be afraid of uh, creative redundancy. Fail, but keep going. Thank you. I think. <laughs> I think a lot of young entrepreneurs are very encouraged with this advice. Thank you so much for your warm and kind words. Mr. Kofi Annan.